sorry. First thing I want to say, really, really sorry that um, whoever was waiting, of course, was waiting for a really long time. Um, four months, five months. Perhaps it wasn't that extreme. Perhaps it was more extreme. I'm not sure. I I've lost track, but it has been a really long time, and I'm sorry. Uh, but to make up for it, I have got some good news, which I'll reveal at the end of the video, anyways. Um, so a lot's changed, actually. Uh, the most major thing I reckon is today. Uh, it's winter right now. Actually, it's autumn, but it feels extremely cold. And I tried a bit of hot chocolate and decided it wasn't too nice. So, me, not liking hot chocolate, I think that's the biggest thing that's changed. And that's quite extreme, so, yeah, that's a good way to start the video. Anyway, I'll move on to the first slide and start explaining what I'm talking about today. And again, wanted to apologise, and I'll give you a bit of good news at the end of this video that might... So yeah, as I went over, I've been away for a really long time. Uh, so it'll take, it'll take me a bit of time to perhaps get back into this. Uh, I'm feeling a bit like nervous right now that I haven't done this for a while, but at the same time I feel a bit more confident, like fresh start kind of thing. Even though we're continuing exactly the same as I did before I left, um, it, it does feel quite new because I'm, I'm not used to doing this right now. Anyway, I'm going to read off the first slide. So, CSS2 is meant to be about further information that isn't needed for people who just want to begin in computing. So, CSS1, of course, that's all the essentials. That is literally the bread and butter of computing. If you want to build a computer, what do you need to know? Uh, in this one, you don't actually, uh, in this series, you don't, you didn't have to understand everything. So, if you haven't followed everything, that's all right. If you just want to perhaps build a computer in Minecraft, most of the things that I'm explaining in this series, you're not going to use in Minecraft because it's way too complicated. Uh, especially this video, you won't use. I don't think you use anything, any of this content in, from this video, if you're building a computer in Minecraft. In real life, you will want to know a bit of electronics, of course, because it's what we, we use in computers. We don't use redstone and things such as what, what I use in my simulation. We use real electronics, but that, that's a whole different series. So an example, like you didn't have to understand the go-to logic I've been over in this, in this series. It would have been helpful, definitely, to know go-to logic, to understand branching and Boolean logic, such as if this is true, do this. If it is false, do the other thing. I think go-to systems are generally a good way to understand how that works, but you don't need to understand how it works. That's the thing. That's why this series is quite unnecessary. So like I said, you won't find most of what you see in this series in Minecraft computers, because Minecraft computers are so simplistic. Uh, you don't have the, the power within your machine, within your computer, to run another computer a proper one at least anyways but you you can create the the basic ideas such as memory alu and um programs but basic programs um so they're not they're not using minecraft computers but in real life we want to make our computers as fast powerful and small as we can and that's all about that all of that pretty much everything that i've mentioned has to do with efficiency um if you want it to be small, you want it to be space efficient, of course. You don't want to have a big circuit just for saving one bit of information. You don't want to have a something that takes really long just to add two numbers, because otherwise you wouldn't use your calculator. You'd get out a piece of pen and paper because you couldn't be bothered to wait for the result. More types of ROM, read-only memory, make it easier for the programmer to write code that the computer can decipher. So there are a couple of types of ROM that I've gone over. Um, program ROM, the first one, and the user input. I said I said those completely the wrong way to what I've written on the PowerPoint. But no, th those are the two ROMs that I've explained so far. The user input, where you you feed the information into the computer, and you've got the, the PROM, program ROM, which is where the computer's instructions are installed. So if you want to run a program, if you want to add two numbers, your computer will go to the program ROM and it will tell it how to do it with the tools it has in its toolbox, which is some memory and an adder. So there are a few variations of the program, the program memory. Uh, you can get 
erasable program memory, electrically erasable program memory, but electrically erasable program memory I kind of associate quite closely with just erasable program memory because it's what it says, isn't it? It's program memory that you can erase. So the difference between normal program memory and erasable program memory is that, of course, you can erase it, but further than that, you can erase program memory, but it's just very specific that it's much easier to erase the memory, to edit the memory within the EEPROM, the electro, um, the sorry, the erasable program memory. So rather than having to stick your hands into the computer, take it apart, and then rewire the instructions that are already programmed into the computer, you can just edit the code on 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 your keyboard, like like you see modern day programmers do. They'll type in a bit of code, it'll be translated for the computer, and it'll be stored. So it's much easier to edit code with erasable program memory than it is to do it with program memory, at least in modern time anyway. So yes, that's that's the thing. You don't have to move the wires around or switch this one off, switch this one on, to put the ones and zeros in program memory to say what instructions you will do, what instructions you won't do. You can just type it into their computer in an understandable language for them and it gets translated. So that's the point of erasable program memory. Okay, so the next type of ROM I'm going to go over is mechanical drives, which is also called a hard drive and it's the term given to part of a computer's memory that has moving parts. So for example, switches or um, I'm not sure, perhaps switches rather than maybe a transistor. So an example of this type of storage, a type of mechanical drive might be an array of switches that you have and you can store information through these switches by having a sequence of ons and off, switches that are on and switches that are off. And binary numbers can be represented mechanically using these switches. If you want a 1, you'd have the switch on, and if you want a 0, you have the switch off. And if they're in an array, if you've got a relay of switches, then you can have the most significant bit, of course, to the left, and the least significant bit to the right. You can have the 1s, column 2s, column 4s, column 8s, column, and you can store information with switches. Um, there are not too many advantages to using mechanical drives, so they're quite slow generally and they're a large form of memory so imagine if your computer at home the way you'd store information is that you'd go into the computer flick a switch turn off a switch flick a switch flick a switch turn off turn off turn off flick turn off turn off flick uh, create some kind of order like that uh, that's another disadvantage um, although you can get some automatic switches mechanical switches that is um, although you can get some that are automatic if you get ones that you have to do yourself, it's very hard to actually program the computer. Um, of course, they're slow because you have to push the switches and they're quite large. Switches aren't quite na nano nanoparticle size, are they? They're not. They're not molecular size. They're like you could hold it. You could hold it in your hand and see it. Like how many of them are you going to get in a computer? You're not going to store a whole lot of information. So they are quite large form of memories, and Actually, they require a lot of maintenance because um, the user is actually required to manually operate them. One advantage that comes with mechanical drives is the way that they're arranged. So although they're not, they're quite large, um, if you do have a large uh, hard drive, um, you can actually store a lot of information on it because, just because of the way that they're arranged. And also, um, in the case of a hard drive again because it's a very common form of mechanical drives in the case of a hard drive you can store information for very long periods of time and even permanently in some cases so that's why you have your RAM in your computer which is considered your short-term memory what you're using right now what you need to have ready for the ALU to operate with and you have your long-term storage in your computer which would be your mechanical drives generally. Uh, your hard drive is in your computer. Uh, your hard drive is a form of long-term long storage. Uh, it will store the information for long periods of time. It's not immediately needed, but it might be needed later on. 
So of course there were disadvantages to the mechanical drive. It's um, it is used in modern computers like the hard drive you would have heard of, but it's the disadvantages would be the maintenance, of course, the the speed at which it writes and reads information, um, and so we make solid state drives. Solid state is the term that's given to is the term that refers to part of a computer's memory that has no moving parts. So a transistor, if you think about it, is electronically operated. You don't have a switch. Um, technically, a transistor is a switch. It can have an on state and an off state, but it's not physically push this forward, push this back, push this backwards, and you get ele electricity flowing through. It's turn it on, turn it off, but you don't have to flick the switch. You can just um, apply a current to part of the switch that says, okay, do I want to store information or do I not? And so it's a switch where you can have it as a one or zero, but you don't actually have to move it. You can, you can turn it on and off billions of times every second. So it's an incredibly fast form of memory by applying a very tiny voltage to the side of the transistor. Uh, I'm not going to go over how this works because um, you'll need electronics and um, things like that to actually understand it. It's it's not really for this series. It's a bit advanced for um, just explaining how how it's used in a computer. But those three people that you can see on the screen there, John Bardeen, Walter Brittain, and William Shockley, were like the founders of. The transistor. The one you've probably heard of most are um, William Shockley and John Bardeen. Walter Brittain perhaps isn't as um, well heard of. No, but the advantages of this, this form of memory solid state drives, so in terms of RAM, things like that with transistors, are that they're completely automated. Like you don't go into the computer and flick each switch, the computer's it for you with, with uh, a tiny voltage, like it uses hardly any electricity. Um, so it's completely automated, the computer will do it for you. It's, it's one of the fastest forms of memory in a computer um, because it can be altered billions of times every second, it's state, just, just from a tiny bit of voltage. Uh, they're really very reliable because um, you only have really two inputs and they don't get mixed up. Uh, sadly, there's a, um, a concept known as Moore's Law, which says that uh, the smaller we make transistors, the more we fit on a chip, the less reliable they will come. But we'll reach a limit eventually and then we'll find some way to get over that. I should hope because we are relying on smaller and smaller transistors to create better technology these days. Um, and so although we're getting them smaller, they are incredibly small anyways. If you've ever perhaps taken apart your computer and looked at the RAM, it's about I'm not too good with measurements, but say five, six inches in length, like half a ruler, half a ruler in length, that would be the size of your RAM. And the amount of information that you can store in it is immense. Gigabytes, like giga refers to, um, I'm not sure how much it is, but mega I know is a thousand bytes or terror no i'm not too sure but de definitely definitely random access memory ram uh, is compact and the reason for it is because you have solid you use solid state drives which are incredibly small and they use transistors which you can fit billions of them on a single chip and of course you have millions of chips or i'm not quite sure how many chips but you have many many chips within a one of those RAMs, one of those RAM, the boards that you put in your computer. Um, so those are the advantages of solid state drives and why they're used for what they're used for. Well, actually, let me explain that. Why are they used for RAM and not long-term storage? Well, the reason is because if they're used for long-term storage, you'd have to consistently apply voltage to the RAM cell to be able to store the information in it. Uh, which is really inefficient in terms of power, which is why you use a hard drive. You don't need to com consistently apply a voltage to to your memory in order to keep the information in there. It, it will always be there because it's it's a mechanical drive. It's got switches. Um, 
it is used for RAM because it's fast and RAM is immediate memory so if you need to get something very quickly to your ALU to add something you'd want to use solid state memory, you want to use a transistor, something that you could get the information out of very quickly. Okay I think I'll wrap up today's video and I'm going to say I didn't actually show the last line one of the reasons was I was running out of time quite a lot um, another reason it's not very um, relevant well it's definitely relevant don't get me wrong but you won't need it to continue with my series um, and understand everything I'm going to say because trust me I'm not going to bring up dynamic RAM or anything like that within CSS2 so you won't need to you, you won't need to worry that I've not covered that and like I said at the beginning of the video I'm very sorry that I've been missing I would like to mention that I actually have created a schedule um, but I lost it yeah that's that's my that's my excuse right now for not showing you my schedule I'll look for it to be honest I'll look for you I'll look for it and perhaps put it at the end of this video but I'm going to talk about what we're going to do in the next video um, and that is I'm going to bring up a new type of information so for now all we've done is we've added definite um, numbers right we've done operations such as 5 plus 3 very simple and these definite numbers are called operands the number 5 in binary 0101 is called an operand uh, next time what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with a different form of information and it's it's called a variable and it can change its value you can assign a value to a variable I don't know if you do algebra but if you if you wanted to write an expression such as what is x plus y you would need to know what x is and what y is or you're not going to get an answer um, I'm not going to explain that in this video uh, so that's variables and it's you define a variable with something called a pointer which again I'm going to I'm not going to explain in this video it will be done in the next one so I hope you enjoyed I hope you learned and I'll see you in the next video where we're going to talk about a new type of information not operands this time they will be they will be included operands so that we can assign numbers to our variables but we're going to talk about variables and how they can be used and I'm going to explain pointers as well probably the first part of the next of the next video so see you next time okay I found my schedule I thought I'd lost it and I think I'll put it at the end of this video quickly um, so I'm going to flick through my different days I have, Monday to, to Sunday, and I'm going to see where I've written something to do with YouTube. And my first one is on Monday, and it is YouTube lesson planning. So I'm going to be planning a lesson for CSS2, or all my other series, by the way, because this timetable could, it could, it could go further than um, just, just, just the time I'm going to spend recording CSS2. Um, Tuesday it doesn't look like I have anything on Tuesday no I don't so Monday I'll be planning uh, on Wednesday I have a little bit of time to record actually so I could do the lesson on Wednesday I also have a bit of time on Saturday to record so I'll do a bit of planning and a bit of lesson lesson time bit of teaching on Saturday I think Wednesday so Monday planning Wednesday will be lessons Thursday I have a little bit of time to do planning but I don't have any time to do actual actual recordings or lessons so I'm sorry but I doubt you'll be getting anything on the Wednesdays um, on Friday I don't generally don't have a lot of time same as with Tuesday which is why I'm doing Monday Wednesday and Thursday for YouTube Friday I don't have a lot of time Saturday um, well my weekends are quite busy to be honest but um, they are weekends and I do have time to be doing things like YouTube so I've decided to do a bit of lesson planning and uh, teaching on the Saturday so Monday I'm going to go over this one more time Monday will be just just the planning not no actual lessons on Wednesday I will do I will do the lessons on Thursday I will do the planning um, on Friday I won't do anything on Saturday I will do a bit of planning and a bit of a, f a bit of teaching as well, a few lessons, because that's just the time I have and it's the schedule I've arranged. I hope you appreciate me making that. Uh, it didn't take long at all. It slots in quite nicely actually with the free time that I did have. So that's one, two or three. 
two two or three lessons every week i'm i'm going to estimate hopefully that's good enough but it's a bit more uh what's the word consistent like uh routinely in terms of the uploads so you know what to expect and when so yeah thank you see you in the next video